again, I apologize for you folks that are out there. I know Dr. Bob and his crew is watching us. He already called me at 701 to let me know we weren't on live. Uh, welcome to the April meeting. First, I want to thank all the uh, vendors and volunteers and the shoppers you came out for the SWAT meet uh, a couple weeks ago. Uh, the weather was nice. Uh, we did have kind of a small crowd. It was about 100 people show up, we estimate. We had about 15 vendors there. Everybody who did come seemed to have a good time. I think part of the the last minute cancellation from the rainy weekend before might have uh, dampened some of the crowds we might have had. I mean, I didn't expect thousands of people, but I did expect more than 100, 100 folks to show up to our first uh, event uh, during COVID outside of a regular river field trip. Uh, I want to thank everybody who showed up. We appreciate it. I uh, thank Mike Burnett at the uh, event. Mike Burnett made a, a very generous donation uh, to TBFC. We appreciate that, Mike. You'll find his... Uh, Mike Burnett's nursery ad in the uh, this month's Chronicles. Please, if you live down near near Bradenton, go see Mike. And you might, even, if you go buy some trees or plants, he might even show you some of his fossils. I know he keeps some there at the shop. He's got some pretty cool stuff down there. Uh, talking with USF, USF will remain closed through the end of through summer, and we will remain virtual here for our club meetings through the end of the season, which is next month already. We've already um, finished up the year pretty much. Uh, Dr. Bob Sinibaldi will be our last speaker. Uh, he, he has a new book coming out and I don't remember the name of it. I apologize it's about the Ice Age. I think it's the Ice Age through story and, and art. He did this book with uh, Herman Trapman, who's a great artist. And he's gonna do a section of the book or uh, a, a uh, presentation he put together called Ice Age Survivors, which should be interesting. And you folks all know Dr. Bob is pretty good with his. Uh, we'll have a good time with that one. That'll be good for our last one. Talk real quick about the Peace River mini adventure. Uh, that's scheduled for April 24th. If you're, if you're going to go, you have to stay at Thousand Trails. As you guys might know, Thousand Trails stopped allowing us in for the last couple of these river trips, because we were bringing so many people in there, I guess their staff couldn't handle it. We had upwards of 200 people going in the river at Thousand Trails, so they locked us out for that event. Uh, but they are well, we are going to go for this mini adventure. And really, the only thing different than Fred or our monthly Peace River field trip is we'll be hunting in uh, Thousand Trails, and you have to be staying there to hunt there. That's the only way you can get in. So people will be camping, doing usual campfires and s'mores, and hopefully the campfire pies and everything people make on the normal Peace River trip. So it'll probably be much smaller. I hear they might already be sold out of uh, camping spots as far as tent sites, but you can give them a call and see what they have left. They did have some cabins. I don't know with the availability of that. And of course they have plenty of RV and small camper space there. Uh, Fred will be there. We'll get somebody to help him with folks in the river in case there's anybody new. Uh, but people always have a really good time at Thousand Trails. It's easy to get in the river from there and people find stuff all the time. It's been one of our favorite spots to go for many years. If uh, Meredith Miller's watching, I apologize for still not getting you that prize from a couple months ago. Uh, I'll get down there and see your son soon and, and get that delivered. And we'll be giving away prizes tonight. Um, I forgot the kind of rock that is, or that a lot of people think it's a cool rock. We have a little shark tooth display. And we have a book on dinosaurs, pretty thick. It's one of those, when you move it, the dinosaurs jump around. It's, I don't know if you can see it there, but it's pretty cool how, how much the, uh, the dinosaurs uh, move whenever. It's kind of neat. Uh, so we'll give those away tonight. We do it old school, just like the old AM radio station where you'll call in and we'll do like the third, fourth, or fifth caller to give those away. And I will only give my phone number out once right before we do it because Eileen... Uh, for my protection, likes to go in there and, and scrub the phone number out of the out of the uh, broadcast. So I only give it once, so she only has, uh, has to do it once. But we'll give that away at the end. And I will remind everybody to please keep their uh, dues paid. We have a uh, if you're if you're in the if you're in the uh, Tampa Bay Fossil Club, not just on Facebook, but actually a member, you'll get a copy of our newsletter every month, except for June, July, and August. Pretty good newsletter. That's Dr. Bob there on the cover, laying next to a mammoth. He's digging out of the 
Peace River right now. I'll give you all the coordinates later when he hangs up. And that's about all the announcements I have. Am, am I missing anything? No? Mm -hmm. So uh, tonight our speaker, Victor Perez, uh, he is confused on his affiliation with the University of Florida, but I do see his uh, assistant curator of paleontology at the Calvert Cliff Marine Museum, which is kind of cool. That's where the, the cliffs up there where they find all the fossils washing out of the hills along the ocean, Atlantic Ocean. He'll explain that a little better, I'm sure, and introduce him himself and his credentials. So Victor, I appreciate you being here tonight, and I appreciate you putting up with the delays, the delays at the beginning, and I'll have Eileen turn it over to you right now. All right. <clears throat> All right, so hi everyone. My name is Victor Perez. I am the Assistant Curator of Paleontology at the Calvert Marine Museum in Solomons, Maryland. So the exposures you're thinking of, the Calvert Cliffs are along the Chesapeake Bay. Um, but I earned my PhD at University of Florida. I actually graduated in August of 2020. So I was in the geology department at University of Florida and also worked at the Florida Museum. And the research I'm talking about was actually the first chapter of my dissertation. Uh, which is basically an overview of the sharks and rays of Florida throughout the entire geologic record of Florida, at least what's exposed at the surface. So a quick, uh, I guess a quick um, teaser here is that basically the rocks exposed at the surface of Florida extend back to about 45 million years. So we're going to be talking about all the shark and rays that we find in Florida across that time period. And this research was funded by the McKnight Doctoral Fellowship, through the Florida Education Fund and the National Science Foundation Graduate Research Fellowship. So uh, amongst the modern chondrichthians, which translates to cartilaginous fish, any fish that has a skeleton made of cartilage, there are three main groups. There are sharks and there's over 500 species alive today. There are rays, there's more than 600 different species alive today and a third group called chimera and there are more than 50 species of those alive today. And I believe you should be able to see my cursor. So uh, three groups that we're gonna talk about the most are the myliobatiform rays. These are often called the eagle rays. There's over 200 species of eagle rays alive today. You're gonna to hear the name Carcharhinoformes a lot, which is often called the requiem or the gray sharks, it includes things like bull sharks and reef sharks. And again, there's over 280 different species of requiem sharks. And third group that's gonna be uh, kind of one of our highlights is the order Lamniformes, which is often called the mackerel sharks and includes things like great whites, makos and sand tigers. Uh, so if we look around Florida today, there's more than a hundred different species of sharks and rays around Florida today. So in total, there's around 1200 different species of cartilaginous fish and about 10% of those occur in the waters around Florida. And the most diverse groups are Lamniformes, Carcharhinoformes, Myliobatiformes, and there's two others that I didn't mention. Ragiformes, which are skates, and Squaliformes, which are often called the dogfish, so deep water sharks. So the reason I didn't mention Squaliformes and Ragiformes in the beginning is because they have a very poor fossil record. Uh, we find very little evidence of them um, in part because Ragiformes have very, very tiny teeth, so they don't preserve very well. And Squaliformes tend to occur in deeper waters and most of our environments around Florida are very shallow waters. So we don't see too many of those in our fossil record. But amongst those different orders there, I said, I'm sorry, amongst those different species, over a hundred, but they can be classified into different groups. We have above the species, you have the genus level, Above that, you have the family level, and above that, you have the ordinal level. So this is how we organize uh, taxonomic diversity. So we'll be talking about that a little bit more as I go on. So when I first started my dissertation, I was actually doing my research in Panama. I wasn't focused on Florida, but there's a collector by the name of Ken Marks, and he contacted the Florida Museum and sent some pictures of cookie cutter shark teeth and inquired about the potential age of those fossils. And based on where he was collecting, we were able to say that his fossils were likely between five and three million years old. Um, 
But more importantly, we had no occurrences of cookie cutter sharks in our collection at the Florida Museum. So we told him this is a really a relatively rare occurrence and that it would be important, something we'd be interested in adding to our collection. So through that kind of serendipitous encounter, I realized how little research has actually been done on the fossil record of sharks and rays in Florida. In fact, there has never been a published comprehensive review of Florida's fossil sharks and rays. There was a master's thesis done in 1969, but it was never formally published. So while there may be some small papers on fossil sharks and rays, there is no one uh, comprehensive guide you could turn to. So that's kind of what I wanted my dissertation to turn into was a comprehensive overview of all the sharks and rays we have in our state. And through that project, we, Ken and I actually ended up publishing a paper on the first occurrence of cookie cutter sharks. And we also found out that angel sharks had never been described from Florida before too. And the really interesting thing is we went to a bunch of different collectors houses, including Gordon Hubble, and a lot of people had cookie cutter shark and angel shark teeth from Florida, but they had never, they had never reached the museum. So one of the things I really wanna drive home through this is that there's a very good chance that you actually have a first occurrence for the state of Florida. So if you ever find an odd shark tooth, um, I, I highly encourage you to reach out to the Florida Museum and inquire about it to see if it is something new or important. So the driving question for my research became how has shark and ray diversity changed around the Florida platform? So you go to the Florida Museum before you enter our fossil hall, you see these large reconstructions of different shark jaws, but they only show you a few different species. Uh, there's actually a lot more than, than what we see right here. So when you think about diversity, there's different ways that we measure diversity in the fossil record. And one is to look at species richness, which is the number of species in a particular time and place. Another way we look at it is called species evenness, which is the relative abundance of those different species within a specific time and place. So if we look over here at community one and community two, both communities have four different species, but community one has an even distribution of those four species, whereas community two has an uneven distribution. So in terms of species richness, their diversity is equal, but in terms of species evenness, community one is considered more diverse. So when we think about fossil diversity, there's been a lot of different studies on fossil diversity. So we typically uh, break up the factors into different categories. So one category would be physical factors like climate change or sea level change. Those are physical environmental factors that can affect diversity through time. Then we have biological factors like competition between species, which can drive diversity through time. And then we have factors that can bias our perspective like preservation. There's different types of rocks which preserve things in different manners and that can lead to a bias in our interpretation of diversity. And there's also our collection effort. You know, are we only surface collecting and focusing on the big things or are we screen washing and really capturing all of the different fossils in that particular area? So these are the kind of the different factors that I would focus on as I was analyzing the sharks and rays in the Florida Museum's collection. And again, there's lots of other studies that have done, looked at diversity um, through time. And one of those studies was actually done here where I am along the Calvert Cliffs. So this was from a paper that was published in 2010. And basically along the Calvert Cliffs, on the northern end, you have our oldest rocks, which are about 20 million years old. And on the southern end, we have our youngest rocks, which are about 10 million years old. And there's about 25 miles of cliff separating those two end members. And along different areas of the cliffs, you find different proportions of teeth. Um, and basically what this study did is look at where is the highest concentration of fossil sharks along Calvert Cliffs. And they correlated that with the environment, um, specifically sea level. So the highest abundance came from beds 10, 12, and 14. And if we look down here, beds 10, 12, and 14 all occur when the Calvert Cliffs was an open marine environment. When we get into our younger sediments, 
it actually shifts to be more marginal marine and almost becomes an estuary environment and we see fewer sharks. So the main point, the main conclusion of that study was basically that locally along the Calvert Cliffs, there's a peak in diversity where we have open marine environment. Um, however, there's other factors, like I mentioned, that could be affecting this. Those, those uh, periods 10, 12, and 14, those beds also correspond with a global warming event where temperatures were at their highest. Uh, so temperature could also be driving our abundance of sharks in this, in this area. So when we think about Florida, as I mentioned, um, the rocks exposed at Florida's surface uh, go back to about 45 million years. I think the oldest are about 48 million years old. So on the left here, you have a geologic map and those different colors correspond with different rock types throughout the state. And it's certainly generalized, um, but there's basically two types of sedimentary rock that makes up all of Florida's surface. Uh, our basal layer is gonna be carbonate rocks, which are limestones and dolomite. So if you look at this picture on the upper right, this is a shark tooth embedded in limestone. So this is a very solid rock, but you kind of see this pitted texture. So limestone will actually dissolve when exposed to weak acid and rainwater is actually slightly acidic. So rainwater can dissolve limestone, but because the teeth are kind of welded into this rock, they don't weather out as easily, so we don't find as many teeth typically in limestone. Our other type of rock is called silica classics. This is mainly sands and clays. So this picture down here at the bottom, this is uh, in one of the Gainesville Creeks. You can see a tooth that's kind of laying isolated on top of that sand. So most of the sands and clays in Florida are not consolidated. They are loose sediments, which makes it very easy for our shark teeth to basically weather out and accumulate in gravel piles. So as Florida developed about 48 to 34 million years ago, uh, Florida was entirely underwater. So it, it was a shallow marine environment and there was a deep water channel that kind of cut through the panhandle of Florida and through Alabama and Georgia. And that deep water channel basically prevented uh, sediments from the US further north to accumulate south. So at that time, that's when our carbonates were forming. That formed our basically the bedrock of, of Florida. Then around 34 million years ago, we have a global cooling event. Temperature plummets. And with that, sea level um, also drops and it allows land to start to emerge. So that deep water channel to the north begins to shallow out and it the name changes and we call it the Gulf Trough. So the Gulf Trough extended into Georgia, but there was a landmass that basically came around the eastern side of Florida. So we have this kind of blend of um, some terrestrial environments and some marine environments. So you get two different types of rocks. And then around 23 million years ago, uh, climate is, is warming up again. Now this Gulf Trough has filled in with sediment and we're starting to get a lot more sediment, sands and clays accumulating on the Florida platform. Uh, and a lot of that sediment is basically coming from the Appalachian Mountains continuing to form. And as those mountains are forming, there are sediments that are being transported southward uh, by rivers and streams onto the Florida platform. We kind of have this gradual development um, of Florida alternating from being a fully marine to kind of a mixed marine and terrestrial environment. And associated with those transitions, we have a transition from carbonate rocks to those sands and clays. And if you know anything about Florida, you know that we get a lot of sinkholes. And those sinkholes are directly related to those two types of sediment. As I mentioned, limestone will dissolve when exposed to a weak acid and rainwater is slightly acidic. So that rainwater will basically permeate through the sands and clays and come in contact with the limestone, dissolve that and form these underground caves we call karst. And when you form that underground cave, you have this hollow space with a lot of weight over top of it. And eventually that collapses inward to form these sinkholes. So our, our different rock types are very important kind of for you know, the natural hazards, but they also kind of dictate where we find lots of 
our fossils and kind of how we find our different fossils. So when you think about where we find our fossils in Florida, it's anywhere that there is active erosion. So this could be naturally occurring on beaches like in Venice Beach. This could be in rivers and streams like the Peace River. We even have ancient sinkhole deposits. Uh, University of Florida owns one fossil site, it's called Thomas Farm. And it is an ancient sinkhole deposit that's about 20 million years old. We have found lots and lots of different interesting terrestrial animals. And then humans, of course, also cause erosion. So through our mining processes and our construction, we are digging up sediment and potentially exposing uh, layers that could have fossils. So, you know, if you're ever fortunate enough when there is still allowing people in to go into any of those phosphate mines, you know that we were actively eroding the rock and exposing those fossils. So now let's talk about what we actually have at the Florida Museum in terms of sharks and rays. So the Florida Museum has over 100,000 specimens of sharks and rays in our collection, which, you know, first hearing that might sound like a large number, but I would, I would go as far as to bet that some people in this club have 100,000 shark teeth in their collection. And if you think about it, the Florida Museum has been around for over 100 years. So on average, we're accumulating about 1,000 uh, shark and ray specimens per year. It's not, a very, uh, it's not a very strong pace of accumulation. And part of that has to do with the fact that sharks and rays have not really had a lot of attention from professional researchers at University of Florida. In fact, if you go through the different professional paleontologists that have worked at University of Florida, there has never been a, a full-time staff member that's specialty was on the fossil record of sharks and rays uh, until a couple years ago. Um, so there was one uh, shark and ray researcher that was hired, but now he's actually uh, uh, the head of the shark attack lab. So he's actually switched his focus to be more so on living sharks than fossil sharks. So most of the research on fossil sharks and rays that has occurred at uh, University of Florida has basically all been done by graduate and undergrad students. So this is one of the reasons why a lot of the research has not been formally published. So as I went through our database um, of these 117,000 specimens, there were 77 different species uh, identified. As I went through them, I was able to basically determined that about a dozen of these were incorrectly identified or no longer accurate names. So at this point, we have at least 65 different species of sharks and rays in our collection over about, again, a 45 million year period, which uh, if, if you think about it, the fact that we have over 100 different species around Florida today, we likely have not fully sampled the sharks and rays in the state of Florida at this point. So one of the things I was doing is basically evaluating the completeness of our, of our record um, and trying to identify where there are gaps. So in order to do that, we need to put these sharks and rays into a temporal context. We need to figure out where they fit within time. And uh, in our database, we can organize it into land mammal ages. So basically um, different land mammals typically are used as a marker for different time periods in the past. And even though these are marine environments throughout Florida, a lot of them still actually have terrestrial fossils that we can use to kind of constrain the age of those deposits, which you likely know if you've collected in the Peace River and you, know, you find shark teeth and then you find a horse tooth. Um, we often find both in the same deposits. So as I was placing it to these, um, these time bins, there was two particular intervals of time I was really interested in. Right here around 34 million years ago where we had that big global cooling event. And around 15 million years ago, we had a really large global warming event. So we often associate diversity with changes in temperature. So I knew that these were intervals and times I would wanna focus on. So when I analyze diversity, I'm analyzing it from two kinds of perspectives. One is taxonomic diversity, which is based on evolutionary relationships. So that first image we kind of looked at of the conjecture tree of life, those are evolutionary relationships between those different um, cartilaginous fish. The other way we look at it is functional diversity, which is based on the ecological role. 
So if you think about um, a, sh a shark like a great white, which is you know, an apex predator versus a stingray that is feeding on the seafloor, they operate in different ways within their environment. So if we can identify how these animals basically live within their environment and we see that um, one of these groups is not doing well, we may be able to understand uh, what areas of the environment are being most affected by changes in temperature or other factors. So now we're gonna look at a lot of beautiful images of the different sharks and rays that we have in Florida. So this um, set of images, this is that group I mentioned at the beginning. This is the Parker rhiniform sharks, also called the Requiem of the gray sharks. So this includes some really tiny teeth like the ones up at the top, which are cat shark teeth uh, and the hound shark. So these teeth you would probably never find unless you were screen washing with a very fine mesh screen. Most of these teeth are gonna be under five millimeters. So they often get missed. Then we have um, more common things like tiger sharks, which you know their teeth are large enough that you will likely find them just by surface collecting. The bull shark is in this group, lemon shark, hammerhead sharks, um, and a few others. And there is actually, this vertebral column is from a lemon shark. So there actually has been things other than teeth that have been found, um, as you likely know if you found vertebra. So the next group here, these are called the lamniform sharks. So we have the top row, um, different species of sand tiger sharks. We have mako sharks, great whites, thresher sharks, and really rare, we only have one specimen, uh, at least one tooth of a basking shark. So basking shark teeth, again, smaller than five millimeters. These sharks are filter feeders. So basically they have, they, they have reduced their teeth to really, really tiny sizes to kind of comb out microscopic food uh, from the water. So unless you're screen washing at a very, very small size, you are likely gonna be missing a lot of those really, really rare taxa. And if you aren't capturing those rare taxa, you cannot accurately really describe diversity through time. So here's a few of our rare species. So again, the top row there are cookie cutter sharks. Uh, next two rows are angel sharks. Then we have some nurse sharks, which are fairly common, um, but again, can easily be missed if you're not screen washing. Um, we have cow sharks. And this one here is a different species of cow shark. We actually have only one tooth of it. This is a genus called Hexanchus. There's only been one tooth of this that I know of from Florida. Others may have it in their personal collection, but we only have one of those in at the Florida Museum. And then the last one down here is a genus called Heterodontis, also called the bullhead shark. Uh, and this one is another one that's really, really rare. It's only been found at two different sites in Florida. And it likely, again, is just because it's a very small species that is often missed. All right, now we have our rays. So, the more common rays are gonna be bull rays, spotted eagle ray, cow nose ray, uh, and another one just called eagle rays. The problem with these are that they all have very, very similar crushing style plates, and it can be very difficult to distinguish them if you only find the isolated fragments like these ones here. Um, but there are a lot more types of rays besides these top couple of rows. Uh, and most of them, again, same story. They're very, very tiny teeth that easily get missed. So the whiptail stingray, which is called Deciatus, um, they, we can actually distinguish between male and female teeth. So during breeding season, males will have these sharp cusps and females will have this kind of more rounded tooth. Um, this is actually one of the most common species in Florida. So in the areas where we have been screen washing, uh, frequently, like our Montbrook fossil site, if you've heard of that, uh, we get thousands upon thousands of these teeth. Um, so if you do screen wash, you are almost certain to find this type of ray. Another relatively rare group of rays are called the manta rays or the devil rays. They are uh, same, same group of rays, but they have a few different species. So again, these are filter feeders. So they have very, very tiny teeth that are just kind of used to comb out 
microscopic food. Um, we probably have about a dozen teeth of, of this species, of these species. So again, fairly rare, but continued screen washing efforts, I'm sure we would find more of them. Um, moderately common are sawfish. So typically you will find what we call as the rostral teeth, but on occasion you can actually find the cartilaginous rostrum. So that long saw blade at the front of their, their head. You can find their vertebrae, which are actually easily to, easy to distinguish. You see this kind of channel that runs through the side. This is how you can distinguish a sawfish vertebra from other shark or ray vertebra. Again, wedgefish, fairly rare, and guitarfish, fairly rare, going to be, again, typically less than 10 millimeters in size. And then this last row here, this is a tooth of that order, Rajiformes, the skates. So these are extremely tiny teeth and very, very difficult to find these intact. Um, big challenge with working with rays, because they have a lot of these really, really tiny teeth, is the fact that you have to stare down a microscope for hours on end to really identify and sort these things. So we have thousands of teeth that really haven't been analyzed in detail. So there is definitely a high potential that we actually have more species in our collection. We just haven't really recognized them for what they are at this point. So these are the different categories for functional diversity that we're going to focus on. These are called dentition types. So basically based on the shape of the tooth, we can infer its function and from its function, we can infer its diet. So one of the most common you'll see are cutting type. These tend to be broadly triangular and are often serrated. And these are used to feed on medium to large fleshy prey. If you have a cutting type tooth, you are probably gonna feed on your prey in multiple bites. You can take a bite and eat it in chunks. So that gives you a wider uh, amount of options of potential prey. Grasping type feeders, they have these long narrow teeth, often have these little side cusplets. Um, so I like to relate cutting type teeth to a knife and grasping type teeth to a fork. So grasping type feeders, they are going to grab a hold of small to medium sized prey, typically feeding on very fast swimming fishes and they often eat their food entirely whole. So they're not able to really break it up into small chunks and that limits the ability of the different types of food that they can feed on. Crushing type teeth uh, tend to have a really large surface area um, like our rays that we saw. So these are focused on hard bodied prey like crabs, clams uh, and snails. So they kind of like to just comb the sea floor, feeling out for hard bodied animals. And they will have a crushing plate like this on the top and bottom of their mouth. So this is kind of like a mallet. If, you're, if you like to eat crabs and you use a mallet to eat it, you can kind of imagine a raise using a similar tool in the, within their dentition. A lot of our really small, um, smaller sharks, we have a separate category we call clutching. So this is again, very similar to grasping where you're going to feed on things that are kind of swift and smaller than you. A lot of these animals are ambush predators that live on the seafloor and basically look for, look for small body fishes or shrimp uh, or squid and just kind of jump at them and grab them. And then our last one is the filter feeders we mentioned, excuse me. So these have reduced their teeth to very, very tiny sizes. They're almost functionless and they basically just work to kind of comb out the microscopic prey. But a lot of the filtration actually in a lot of sharks and rays will happen through the gills. So the teeth are not really doing a lot. Second way that we look at functional diversity combines a lot of different factors and it's called the ecomorphotype. So this takes into account which part of the uh, marine environment you're living in, what diet do you have, what's your locomotion strategy, how are you swimming through the water, and just a general overall anatomy. So our ecomorphotypes are basically inferred based on living species. So we cannot confirm the locomotion of a fossil species just by looking at its tooth. But if we look at a species that is uh, what we believe to be related, we can infer what its locomotion would have been like. So within our Florida fossil record, 
we have 21 different types of ecomorphotype. So the benefit of looking at this is, let's say um, we have a big decline in our uh, ragibenthic species that may tell us that those hard bodied animals, those clams, uh, snails and crabs were suffering an extinction and there was fewer prey items available for those to feed on, so they also suffered an extinction. So we try to use ecomorphotypes to make connections across the ecosystem. So as I broke up those 117,000 teeth into our different time bins, um, first thing you start to notice is that the sample size between these time bins is extremely uneven. Our oldest unit, which is again, about 45 million years old, we only have 21 shark and ray teeth from that time bin. Our most abundant group, which is about five to 10 million years old, we have over 88,000 specimens from that unit. So we have a very biased sample between these different time bins. So these graphs on the right here are basically showing you when we think that we have accurately sampled the diversity in a particular time bin. If the curve comes to a plateau, then that means that we have likely sampled most of the species in that area. But if the curve has a very steep slope to it, then that means that we are likely missing a lot of the species from that time bin. So this helps us identify the particular time periods where we may wanna focus our collecting efforts to even out our sampling to analyze diversity more accurately. And again, I'm gonna constantly harp on this Unless we are screen washing through a very, very fine screen, we cannot accurately sample diversity in time. So I always like to highlight Ken Marks because this is like his strategy is always to collect micro matrix. He lays it out on his driveway, driveway to dry, and then he will pick through it in a microscope to find all of those tiny species. And he has probably found, um, I wanna say it's about 10 different new records for the state of Florida. Uh, through doing this. So he was the first one to find, first one to report to the museum, cookie cutter shark, angel shark, horn shark, um, those devil manta rays, and, and a number of others. So unless you're screen washing, you're, you're probably not gonna find a, a new species for the state of Florida. So when we plot out our diversity, when we look at taxonomic diversity and we focus on our climate events, so EOT is our global cooling event where temperature dropped. It seems like diversity is relatively stable through this. Um, but if you look at the number of families, it actually does decline. So there is a slight extinction of, of sharks here. During our global warming event, we are having an increase in species through time. However, this green, this green line here, this is our sample size. So basically our diversity is really being controlled by the amount of specimens available for us to study. So what you can say from this is that the Florida Museum's collection is very biased towards particular time periods. And that tends to be on the younger end. And when you think about it, our older rocks are those limestones where the teeth are basically welded into the rock and they don't readily remove themselves. So they're harder to find. Whereas our younger rocks are those sands and clays that erode very readily and accumulate fossils in those gravel deposits. So it makes it very easy to find large numbers of teeth in that type of rock. So a combination of sample size and rock type, there are certainly two factors that we know are likely biasing our understanding of diversity through time. And the story is kind of the same when we look at functional diversity. So it appears that our functional diversity is increasing across this global cooling event and um, either increasing or kind of staying stable through our global warming event, depending which of our functional diversity metrics we use. But again, the trend follows our sample size. So we have not accurately sampled our fossil record of sharks and rays through most time periods, basically is what, what we can derive from this. However, if we look at the relative abundance of the different groups, 
you can start to uh, come to some conclusion. So this break right here between these first two columns is our global cooling event. So the biggest group before the global cooling event is this green bar here, which is the lambdaform sharks, the mackerel sharks. Following that big global cooling event, the next, the, the most abundant groups are myliobatiform rays and carcharinoform sharks. So there's a transition in taxonomic diversity across this global cooling event. And as we get to our global warming event around here, our carcharinoform sharks have begun to dominate the environment. And this is interesting because in nearshore environments today, carcharinoform sharks are the most diverse and abundant group. So it was during this global warming event that the ecosystems basically established um, a composition that is comparable to today. So if we wanna talk about uh, biodiversity loss today, around this time period is when we start to see a more similar um, composition of sharks and rays that we could compare to, to kind of understand uh, what that really is telling us. This shift from lamniform to carcharinoform sharks also corresponds with a shift in function. So most lamniform sharks have a grasping type dentition, whereas most carcharinoform sharks have a cutting dominant dentition. So this likely indicates a shift towards um, dietary preference towards larger prey. So the fact that carcharinoform sharks are able to basically eat their prey in small bites, that allows them to feed on a wider, um, a wider uh, diversity of potential prey. So they have more food options, so they are, they are more successful. Um, so this, this is pretty interesting. But what we're lacking in this analysis is basically what's happening to those small benthic species, the ones that are living at the sea floor. And it's again, because they have those very tiny teeth that are likely being missed just because we are not uh, screen washing at all of our fossil sites. So if we go over to Alabama, there is an Eocene site called the Point A Dam. And it is not limestone, it is actually siliciclastic. So they do find really large numbers of shark teeth. So there was a study in 2016 where they described about 4,500 teeth from this site. And 56% of the sharks um, were lamniform sharks. So this was, again, this shows, this confirms, this was the most diverse and abundant group uh, before that global cooling event. And if you look at these teeth, a lot of them have a very similar shape. Uh, most of them don't have serrations, relatively tall and narrow, and pretty much all of them have these side lateral cusplets. So again, I relate this shape to a fork. Most of these um, species are grasping style feeders and are focused on swift feeding prey items. But following that global cooling event, we lose the vast majority of these species, they, they go extinct. And we see this in Maryland as well. So um, one of the very popular places to collect in Maryland is called Per State Park. It's publicly accessible. Uh, and this is a site that's about 60 million years old. So this is before a global cooling event that happened around 34 million years ago. And if you look at all the teeth, they tend to be those really tall, narrow pointed teeth. So mostly grasping style feeders. Then if you go to Calvert Cliffs, a really popular place to go is called Bayfront Park, um, also known as Brownies Beach. It's about 20 million years old or most of the fossils you find there. And now we start to see more of these kind of broadly triangular and serrated teeth. So more of these cutting style feeders. We still have some grasping style feeders, but they're no longer dominating the, the diversity that we see. So it's not just in Florida that this transition happened, it was actually worldwide. This was a global extinction of those lamniform grasping type, grasping type feeding sharks um, that happened around that global cooling event. But we're very, very limited by these different sampling biases that we talked about. So one of our first problems is that preservation bias between our two different types of rocks. The only way to overcome this bias is to put more effort into collecting carbonate rocks. 
So you may have heard of the Ocala limestone. Uh, I heavily encourage you, anytime you see a block of limestone in Florida, just check the surface out and see if there's a tooth exposed because there's so few teeth that have been collected from, from that time period that it could be something rare or important. The next problem is collection effort. There is a focus on the neogene, which is basically around the last 23 million years. You think about a lot of collectors, which species they are after? Megalodon. Megalodon is the prize that most people want to collect. So people focus their efforts on the time periods and the locations where Megalodon can be found. And this kind of leads to a feedback loop where we get more and more teeth from that time period. Uh, and that leads to us having that one time bin that has 88,000 of our 117,000 teeth. Um, then professional paleontologists, we have also been biasing this. So as I mentioned before, a lot of the research effort at University of Florida has been focused on the terrestrial realm, what's happening with our land mammals. And not a lot of focus has been put into what's happening in the marine realm. So we certainly need to uh, increase our research efforts in the marine realm. It's not just sharks and rays. Uh, there's been very little research on the whales and dolphins from Florida and very little research on bony fish from Florida as well. And then finally, um, the more accurate we can get with dating of our fossil sites, the more informative our conclusions are. So the fact that a lot of our fossil sites are basically tied to land mammal ages is somewhat of a limitation. Um, we should probably be moving away from that. And one of the things we can do is we can actually analyze the chemistry of shark teeth, specifically looking at the element strontium. If we look at the isotopic ratio of strontium in shark teeth, we can use that to date um, the different teeth and get a better idea of when these species were living. Um, so one of the other things I highly encourage is the use of my fossil database, which I'll talk about shortly. Uh, but this is basically a social media site for anybody interested in paleontology where they can share their finds. So this is what the home screen looks like if you were to look up my fossil. So right now there are, th this is definitely out of date, but there's well over 300 members on the site. Um, lots of different posts. Basically there are different forums and groups you can contribute to. And we also have an e-museum. So if you upload a picture of your fossil, we have uh, volunteer curators that will help you identify that fossil, make sure the data is accurate. And then if it is deemed accurate, they will mark it as research grade, which basically gives it uh, validation that this, this information is accurate and can be used by a researcher um, to, for study. So we actually ran a program um, uh, about a year ago now, where we, call, we called it the Fossil Blitz. And our goal was basically to reach a thousand re research grade specimens on the site. And we had different prizes for people that uploaded a certain number of specimens and things like that. And one of the really interesting outcomes of this was uh, we had a participant who lives in Greece that started uploading fossils onto the site. And it turns out most of these things were new records. Um, there's a, there was very little research on fossils from the island of Kos in Greece. So when you upload your specimens to this site, you are making them potentially accessible for research, um, which, is, which is only gonna benefit the field of paleontology. By uploading onto here, there's two things I wanna point out. You are not required to make your locality information public there's an option you can check that says do not disclose location. So if you're worried about giving away your secret fossil site, you don't have to. You can still make your specimen available for research, but not tell the world where exactly it was found. Um, the other thing is you are not obligated to donate anything. Uh, just by taking a photograph of your specimen, you're creating what we call a digital voucher of that specimen. So if I can see your specimen, I can verify its identity then that, that's all I necessarily need for certain types of research. So this is a way you know, to maintain your personal collection, but still contribute to scientific research. Um, again, one of the resources you have on there are forums. 
Uh, I'd say our most popular forum is called What Is It? Which is if you just have something, you have no idea what it is, post it on there and our community will try to help you identify it. Um, under the resources tab, one of the options is destinations. And so there is a map of different collecting sites, different museums, different fossil clubs. Um, on occasion, we'll post field opportunities where you could come dig out, dig fossils with a professional paleontologist and things like that. So just tons and tons of different resources for anyone interested in paleontology really at any level. So when you do upload a specimen to our e-museum, this is basically what the process looks like. Essentially, it's emulating exactly what a museum would do. So it starts with an image because we need that image as that voucher to confirm what it is that you're looking at. Then we have classification. So again, if you're not comfortable, comfortable identifying your fossil, the community can help you identify it. Then you enter your locality information. Again, the locality information can be visible to everyone on the community, or it can only be visible to um, kind of the admins of it if you check that box that says do not disclose location. The geologic context is basically the, the rock type that it came from, what's the rock unit. And again, our community can help you determine which rock layer your fossils came from. Dimensions is kind of an extra field. You don't necessarily have to fill out, but if you wanna take measurements of your fossil included in there, you can. And then there's an opportunity for field notes. If there's anything interesting about how it was found or something like that you wanna include, you can add that there. So you upload these specimens, it gets added to our e-museum, and then it gets verified as a research grade specimen. And one it is, once it is marked as a research grade specimen, it gets the data gets sent to a new database, which is called uh, GBIF, which is Global Bio Biodiversity Information Facility. On GBIF, there's over a billion specimen records of different natural history collections. So the more data that we can accumulate in these databases, the bigger and broader questions that we can ask about the past. Um, so it, I think it's a really cool opportunity for really anyone to contribute to science. So just to kind of summarize what we've gone through, um, one of the main things that we were able to see by doing this evaluation of the sharks and rays from Florida is that there was, a made, there was this big transition from lamniform to carcarhinoform sharks that happened around that global cooling event. Um, and there has been a lot of debate about when that happens, but I think that we can be pretty confident that it, it is coincident with this global cooling event. Associated with that is a shift in the, the tooth function from being dominant, dominated by grasping style feeders to being dominated by cutting style feeders. And that likely corresponds with a shift towards larger prey. So if you think about it, whales and dolphins first appear around around 40 million years ago, but they don't really start to radiate and diversify until after that global cooling event. So you have these marine mammals that are a new, relatively new and large prey item. So you get a lot of sharks and rays shifting their dentition to kind of exploit this new prey item. Uh, but despite these conclusions, there is a lot of sampling bias that really inhibits our ability to understand what's happening in the past and I think we should use these gaps in our, in our collection to dictate our, our future collecting efforts. So again, I highly encourage you to screen wash with a really fine screen to capture those really small teeth. And I really encourage you to look into our older rocks in those limestones and, and try to find um, some of those older, rarer sharks. And, and always share your finds with the museum because you never know when you might have something new to science. Um, so one thing I want to promote real quick at the Calvary Museum, uh, I've been working on a new exhibit on sharks and rays. So this exhibit is going to open in July of this year. So if you are visiting Maryland at any point, I, I encourage you to stop by the museum and, and check out this new exhibit. So with that, I thank you and I'll, I'll answer any questions you all have. Thank you, Victor. Am I back on Eileen? So uh, one of the things I found interesting was the, uh, the collection 
efforts bias. Uh, as a longtime Florida fossil hunter, and I, I know a lot of folks in our club would never uh, realize that shark's teeth or anything related to sharks or rays would be rare or unusual. And actually, one of the uh, one, some of the fossils in your paper, my wife and I found mm -hmm. uh, was the the rostrum, and I I knew it was a a sawfish rostrum when I found it because I have some modern ones that I, I'd collected over the years. But I, I was trying to find the species name. When I showed it to Dr. Holbert, he told me that uh, that they didn't have any of those in the record, in the collection. And I found it very hard to believe. I didn't doubt him, you know, because it's Dr. Holbert, but it, it was just very hard to believe that they couldn't have a sawfish rostrum. And I think the uh, sawfish tooth right, tooth right next to it in the picture mm -hmm. by a buddy of ours that were on the same dive trip, although they were unrelated. And it, it was just hard for us to believe that those, those things didn't already uh, exist in the collection. So I, I wish there was a some method where the folks who are writing papers on this stuff in Florida could contact the clubs and let them know, here's what we're looking for. And we certainly have people who would who might have it in their collections and uh, donate it, like we donated the rostrum. Uh, and we have people, there's like a guy in our club named Joe DeMott. Anytime he hears somebody's looking for something, he goes out and looks for it. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of the clubs, clubs and club people are really good about helping when they know, but I don't think a lot of us would have ever dreamed how rare uh, in the collection the sharks and rays were outside of the, the easy to pick up off the beach and bottom of the river type sharks teeth. Yeah, so there's certainly, it certainly is a surprise and it was a surprise to me too. Like I said, I my initial research was not focused on Florida because I just kind of assumed that there had been a lot of research on sharks and rays of Florida. I mean there's news articles that call Florida the shark tooth capital of the world. It kind of gives this false impression that we already know a lot of things about, about the sharks. And I think also with the, our fossil permit for the state of Florida, it's, it's to collect vertebrate fossils, but it does not include shark teeth in that permit because they're so abundant. Um, but it, it sends this kind of wrong message about their importance, I think. I think the fact that shark teeth are omitted from that permit makes people think that they don't have scientific value or that they're just extremely common, but um, that's not exactly true. It's shark teeth are extremely common from certain time periods and certain locations, but certain species and certain time periods are very, very uncommon. And I think that's where we really need to focus our attentions. A lot of folks in our club have expressed interest with the, with the micro fossils uh, whether it be out of river sediments or from um, a lot of folks go out west or different places and will bring back bags of sediment for people to look through. So I think by your presentation tonight, a lot more folks may maybe take a look at that and include you in some of their uh, some of the fossils uh, they find. And when Eileen puts this on on Facebook, or I'm sorry, on YouTube, whenever she she'll upload this after the live presentation here in the next few days. If you're okay with it, maybe she can include your email address in the in the description of the of the uh, video, and people will have a way to get in contact with you if they if they choose to send you some pictures pictures or show you what they're finding. Certainly, yeah, no problem. All right, uh, a lot of thank yous on here. Uh, one lady wanted to point out Kathleen Archer watching from Massachusetts. She wanted you to know uh, folks up north are watching. <laughs> um, thank you. We don't have any questions coming in. So I'll, thank you very much. You're welcome to stay up for the next few minutes and watch me hawk out these few uh, door prizes here, but uh, or you're welcome just to hang up and which, whichever, whichever suits your fancy. And I appreciate you coming. I'll, I'll sign off and let, and let you guys all have a chance to win. I won't, I won't try and swipe that dinosaur book from anybody. <laughs> all right. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Uh, I appreciate your attention and feel free to contact me if you ever have any questions. Thank you, Dr. Victor. Yeah. Are we still on the, uh, we're still live? Yeah, we're still good. Okay, good deal. I can't see my, oh, I see myself up there. Okay, so we'll, I'm going to give out my phone number just one time. So write it down and don't start calling until I say call. Oh.
only time I'm going to give it out. If you didn't have a pen and paper ready. Uh, so first thing we're going to give out is this little globe of some kind of special rock. I don't know what kind of rock it is. I'm not a rock guy. But I'm going to take the third caller for this. And there's a delay, so I'll kind of sit here and look like a knucklehead for a second until the calls start coming. But in the meantime, we do have the meeting is May 1st. That's Dr. Bob, East River Mini Adventure. Your caller number one. Thank you. Your caller number two. Mike Davis. That's me. You are caller number three, buddy. Oh boy. I will you get you'll get the globe. And we'll get that to you, buddy. All right. Thank you. All right, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. We'll do caller number four for the um, shark. Caller. Well, hello, Sarah. Hello. Well, I wish you would have said Uncle Mike, because now everybody thinks it's a, a fix. No, you, you, you're the next caller. Caller from uh, Grand Rapids, Michigan. Good to hear your voice. You won the uh, the little shark tooth sample here. I might, have, I might hold it hostage till you come down and see us, but otherwise, I'll mail that up to you. Okay. Thanks for calling. Love you guys. And the next caller is Rain. Yeah. You won, buddy. You won the uh, cool dinosaur. They, they move and talk to you. And so cool. you won, sir, uh, a two-time winner. Well, you and Mike, you and Mike Davis are both two-time winners. So thanks. <laughs> thanks for playing. We'll get that book to you. We'll see you. Bye-bye. Alrighty. Bye-bye. And that's it. All the prizes have been given out, all three of them. If there, if I don't see any questions popping across, I don't. Uh, we'll give it a second because we are in a time delay. But if anybody has any questions for me, uh, pop those on there real quick and I'll answer them. Otherwise, again, just remind you, please keep your dues paid if you don't mind. Uh, we have a great newsletter. Next month will be the last newsletter for the season. But if you're, if you're in the club, you'll get a copy of this mail to you, a hard copy every month. And email if you choose it to be that, uh, choose to get an email. Really good newsletter with articles by Dr. Bob. We got uh, paleo analysis by Steve Vicari every month. And we've also got another regular column. In Touch with Inverts by Rob uh, Carlson. And there's no questions coming around. So I thank you guys for uh, spending the evening with us. And we'll see you on at the Peace River Mini Adventure with Fred Hendershot. And we'll see you on May 1st here again for hopefully our last uh, virtual meeting. We'll be talking to the University of South Florida for the upcoming, uh, for the fall. Uh, they, they say they're going back live. Uh, I'm sorry, live in person, I should say. Uh, at the school for classes, but they haven't given me given me a decision on what they call ad hoc events yet, which is us. Uh, but we're really hoping we get back in. If we do, I'll try to maybe get a different building than we've had in the past. It's a little bit bigger, so people may feel comfortable uh, coming to um, have a little people more room to spread out if possible.